dating is like being back in high school. I mean, th- there's still that same energy. Of, oh uh, do God. we connect? Are they turning me on? Do I, you know? I was blown away because she was actually better than her profile. So, I mean, oh my God, I, this is wonderful. <laughs> this is Crow's Feet, a place where we ponder the question, are these our golden years or does aging just suck? Well, yes, getting older is not for the faint-hearted, but aging also brings wisdom and humor, a finely tuned perspective on life. In our podcast, you'll meet writers and others rethinking our later years, people who inspire us to reimagine our future. What is it like to try the dating scene as a senior? Hi, I'm Jane Trombley, host of the Crow's Feet podcast Valentine's Day special. Of course, it's all about love. How do we find the next great love in our 50s, 60s, or beyond? Our guests and experts, Gloria Horsley and Frank Powers, are retired psychologists who know this turf well. They are the co-authors of a new book, Open to Love. It's a must-read for seniors who are at least curious about what Cupid might have in store. We spoke to them from their home in Arizona, and we'll put links in the show notes. Hi! Welcome to Crow's Feet, Gloria and Frank, and congratulations um, on the publication of your book, Open to Love. It is an exciting topic for a lot of seniors, and I think you come from a particular expertise. You have a professional grounding in relationship counseling, both couples and, and Gloria, in your case, in in grief and bereavement. Um, You've been in a committed two-year relationship with a romantic story of twists and turns. Let me say one thing. I did not set out to write a book on online dating. Absolutely not. not. Never online dated in my life. I wanted women to have an idea of what it's like to go into a relationship when you're older. I mean, I was so blown away by the changes, by the changes, by what was going. I mean, I just wanted women to know what I had been up against. And then I decided I needed to do a chapter on online dating because the guy that I'd been with had online dated. And he said to me, I'm going to be, you know, I'll find somebody else or whatever. And I'm like, really? (laughs) <laughs> and then I met Frank and I'm like, here he is. Okay. Uh, I think it's fair to say to our uh, to our listeners that there's a spoiler alert. Uh, you met online. And Frank is four years younger than me. Yes. I am addressing my relationship <laughs> with a cougar. Yeah. <laughs> so anyway, we had so much to talk about because we're of the same era and we had the same training and, you know, as therapists, yes. he's been a therapist for 40 years. I've been a therapist for 40 years and we just have never parted ways. Yeah. Since. yeah. After meeting one another, it was hard to be separate. I mean, yeah. we just really enjoyed the connection. But there's so much more to talk about. And so, Gloria, I'd like to start with um, your experience of becoming a, a widow after a 60 year marriage and how that might have set the stage for writing Open to Love. I was married for 60 years and had had four kids. And uh, my husband uh, died after 60 years of marriage of a staph infection after surgery. And he'd had a number of surgeries, so he'd been ill before. But um, he did pass away of a, a, a staph infection. And I, um, because I was a therapist at the time and had been involved in the grief and loss world since my son was killed in an automobile accident many years earlier, and um, I had counseled myself, you know, um, do what you tell people to do. So I decided I needed to sign up for a grief group and it was COVID. So it was online. And I met a guy on uh, who played golf. I'm an avid golfer. And so we started playing golf together every day. And because his wife died two days after Phil. So this is five months in. And so, uh, you know, I would never say to somebody, oh, you want a date after five months? Five months, yes. It was, uh, we were golfing. We golfed every single day. And I'm a pretty good golfer. And he's he was a really good golfer. So we golfed and golfed. And, and then eventually he moved in with me to my house. And, um, you know, uh, it was kind of ins and outs because he had a little bit of trouble because I was still working and he wasn't. And 
And also, uh, I have traveled with my grandkids. I was going taking them to Africa, and he didn't want to go, and he wasn't happy that I was going. So it was fine as long as we were around golfing together. So at Christmas time, after seven months of being with him, I had 27 people in Hawaii. We had a couple of big houses there, and my whole family congregated. And uh, he came with us, Steve, and I stayed a week later, which he wasn't happy about. And, you know, he was welcome to stay, but he didn't want to. And so um, he goes back to the, the house in Palo Alto and, sa- and sends me a text that says, hey, you know, uh, I should have talked to you about it earlier, but I want you to know it's not working for me. And the key's on the counter. And I he ghosted yeah, her. Keys on the counter. Our, we had a joint bank, banking account is closed. And uh, I'm sorry. And that was it. He couldn't handle her family. Uh, yes. the, the whole, he just wanted, you know, me to be more dependent and more low key and whatever, whatever. Anyway, so I there and guess what? I got COVID. So I couldn't leave. So I'm in Hawaii in a hotel room by myself. And I always kind of get my thoughts together by writing articles or a book or something. So when I first got in-laws, I wrote a book called The In-Law Survival Manual. So that's (laughs) how I kind of organized my mind. So I thought, I learned so much from this relationship that I didn't know after 60 years with the same guy. I'll I'll write a book for widows. That's what helped me figure it out. So I'm like, well, I guess if I'm going to write a book on widows, I need to put a chapter on online dating. So I went online and said dating over 60 or 50. And I came up with Silver Singles as the site to use. So I went on Silver Singles and I met two guys on Silver Singles who were in Arizona. I was staying with my sister then. And she was, you know, kind of helping me through the grieving process. And so I um, went to Arizona and I met one guy, Dave. He wore his Shriners shirt (laughs) to the first meeting with her. He had Dave across the lapel. (laughs) So after those two, I looked pretty good. (laughs) Well, yeah. And when I met Frank for coffee, I mean, for actually, I broke all the rules that you weren't supposed to do. Too bad for happy hour. Happy hour. Anyway. Generally is not something suggested. So I, Frank had sent me his website because he's a sculptor and a therapist. And I'd sent him my Open to Hope website and my. So we knew quite a bit about one another. And we knew that we were involved in the community and that we weren't scammers or anything like that. So it was very easy for us to have the first meeting, which just went swimmingly well. Yes, indeed. So I met Frank and uh, I said to him, first thing off, I just want to tell you that I'm not really dating. I'm writing a book for widows. This is research. <laughs> and I thought, now there's more going on here than research. <laughs> <laughs> One of the big things about the book at the beginning is the sense of the buddy system. Could you talk a little bit about that? Because I think for people who don't know where to begin, and they're older and they've been out of the dating scene altogether for a while. Certainly online dating is a strange and maybe bewildering uh, animal. How does your buddy system that you describe help? We really felt like that it's a new adventure. And this did not exist for most of us back when we were 20 and 30 years old. So this is a brand new thing. And you really need to have a support group. And we call it dating buddy. And it could be one person or it could be several. Uh, We kind of think that it's good to have more than one because you never know when you're going to need to get a hold of your dating buddy and talk about an experience on on a date or something that either went extremely well or did not go well. Either way, you need a dating buddy to talk this over with and make it natural and normal and part of the process of just learning how to date in this new era. Right. And also, technology can be an issue. You know, if you have trouble getting your picture, you know, doing these different websites, you might find a dating buddy who's younger. Grandchildren are great. Grandchildren. Because they know the system. They know how to do the They've been dating. They get a kick out of going over your pictures with you and doing all this kind of stuff. And they will help you get online. And they won't be like, oh, grandma, you shouldn't do that. They'll be like, grandma, this is awesome. You're hot. (laughs) 
You need a digital native uh, buddy. Or your older friends, you know, who are online. But your kids are not particularly good dating buddies because they don't want to hear about your romantic life. I mean, they're only so, you know, want to go so far with this. They're thing. worried about you. They're afraid someone's going to scam you or, right. you know, you're going to be broken hearted again and they don't want you hurt. And and your married friends aren't going to be happy when you call them at 10 o'clock at night. They don't. Tell them about your date. Obviously, the online dating world worked beautifully for, for you guys. Absolutely. But there are there are other options. If you put your money in, and become an online dating, there's a little gland in your brain that says, I'm dating. And you start getting out of your sweats. Yeah. You yeah. start and, and telling people you're doing online. Yeah. You might meet somebody at class reunion. You might meet them. Who knows where you might and, meet them? Grocery and, shopping. You might meet them. Yeah. Who knows? But, but online is honestly where the most action is. And for women, it's particularly good because online dating at, at for seniors, it's really 50-50. Right. And it's not 50-50 in the real world. So women have a much better chance of meeting people they wouldn't normally meet if they go online. The biggest thing is you, you generally don't necessarily want to have a long distance relationship. But if that's what happens, that's what happens. But you do have to be careful with long distance relationships. And under no circumstances, if you go online, should you ever give money give to anybody money. or any no, reason? No money. No money. Yeah, let's circle back to that because I think the whole financial thing uh, gets to be very thorny um, as a relationship takes wing. But I wondered about this uh, geography thing. When you put in your sort of your search parameters, can you geolocate? Stipulate uh, how far far distance you're willing to go. And in rural areas, you know, it is a little more difficult. In urban areas, you generally don't have a problem with having enough people in your geographic area. But you can imagine in rural areas, you might have to go a longer distance uh, to meet someone who would be, you know, someone who might possibly be the one. Yeah. So be open to that and open to uh, a broader geographic range than you might otherwise yes. live but in. You want to meet them in person as early as possible because that eliminates the scamming. You get a much better feeling for the person. Yeah, there's got to be some chemistry. Yeah. Yeah. You give so much good practical advice in your book, and I'd love to get to these broader issues and some of your uh, your anecdotal experiences um, about not so much the dating, because clearly it worked for you, but the the challenges along developing a um, a committed relationship, mm -hmm. and specifically the one that I think that worries family members and can be an issue is money management. Well, the reality is you're never going to have exactly the same amount of money. It's just one person is going to have very more than others. That, it would right. be very rare if you had exactly the same amount of money. So you need to look at that and decide how you want to deal with it. And there's it. a number of ways of, of dealing with that. A prenuptial agreement is not foolproof, but it's certainly very helpful to do that. If and you a lot decide of people to get think, married. Yeah, if you decide to get married. And you know, prenuptial is helpful uh, but really, in a sense, it's not it's not going to answer all questions that you have. And uh, so one of the things that you need to do is really have an open conversation and talk about it. It's not exactly the most romantic thing to do. But I will tell you, if you want a long term committed relationship, you need to discuss the money issue. And you need to discuss it early on about what you're going to do. Your family needs to know. I have a yeah. friend now who's having trouble three years in because he and the woman he's li uh, married to now want to buy a house together and his kids are now upset about oh, it. Upset. I mean, these things have to be discussed. I mean, you can have problems down the line. You're just setting up problems. But um one of the things that you start with in your profile is I want somebody who's financially responsible. I am. Uh, I, I expect that. you to yes. be. I want to know people have a retirement plan and, you know, yes. that they're they're taking care of themselves physically as well as financially. I do it. I expect you to do it. And don't go with somebody that you don't know anything. Oh, by the way, you can go online 
and uh, through places like the white papers and yeah, find out verify and find out if people have been bankrupt. Yeah, and that you, kind you of can thing. find out all kinds of things from public records. My son-in-law is a lawyer and he investigated Frank thoroughly. <laughs> he has, I was vetted. Finances are an issue and your kids may not be happy that you're dating somebody and they may not want you to and they may not want you to get married and they may, you know. You have to figure out your finances and figure it out with your partner. And I think that's an issue where senior wisdom really comes into play. And whereas in one's 20s or even 30s, you can get so caught up in the, the romance and the sort of va-va-voom of a relationship that, and you're young enough to weather these storms, but not so much in your 60s, 70s or beyond. So you want to know exactly what, but what both of you are what's going on and how you want to go forward together. Uh, now, Gloria and I thought that we were going to get married and, and we had a license and we had a prenuptial and we had all these kind of things. And then uh, because we had some insight about things, we decided, you know what? Uh, for us, there's really no reason to get married. And if there is, we'll always do it. But but yeah. it's a choice. You don't have to. Like anything, you're... Um old enough to do what you want. What is the advantage of getting older? <laughs> or few, but... <laughs> exactly. You're listening to the Crow's Feet Valentine's Day special with doctors Gloria Horsley and Frank Powers, co-authors of Open to Love, The Secrets of Senior Dating. If you are 55 or older, we'd love to hear your story. Whether you're in the dating game, just thinking about it, or maybe afraid to put your toe back into that water please call our Crow's Feet feedback line at 943-300-5227 to share your experience or feelings about senior dating. That's 943-300-5227. First names only, and the call is free. There are surprising instances that, that come up, and particularly as we get older, around health care around uh, caregiving, around um, sort of preparing for, you don't like to think about it, but end of life. Have you been challenged by those things and how have you navigated them through your relationship? Well, uh, my husband had had like 12 back surgeries and I had, had taken care of him a lot. And I just didn't want to do that again. And we know a lot about caregiver burnout. We see it all the time as yeah. therapists. Caretaker syndrome is really a something that can yeah. really spoil a good relationship. In my case, my aunt, who is like my second mother, was with my uncle. And he had a stroke and had some problems. And she decided that she wanted to care for him at home and really didn't get extra assistance, which she could have. And she ended up being kind of like a shrew to him, angry because of the caretaking that she had. And it was way beyond what was necessary for her to do, but she felt obligated to do it. And it kind of ruined their really nice relationship. It was sad for me to go over and visit them and yeah. see how this wonderful, beautiful love story was really damaged because of caretaking. Yeah. So it's a real issue. I hear so many women tell yeah. me, I don't want to date because I don't want to be a nurse or a person. Then all, or the the, all, and the honey doer. all the women yeah. stop playing bridge and giggle together about it. It's, and I'm like, OK, you're going to be lonely because you can't stand up and say, I want a prenup if you want to get married. You can't stand up and say, hey, Frank, when you have your knee done. I am going to be in Hawaii. I'm going to be in Hawaii having fun. You you need to take care of this. This just happened to us, by yeah, the way. Well, I yeah. read about it I in the book. So we get to Arizona, and he's going to have his knee done. And I recruit my friend, and we go to Hawaii. We're going to stay for a month because that's when he can drive again. So I get a call in Hawaii. I'm there for Christmas with my buddy. Hi. By the way, I was on the gurney going in to have surgery. I had the IV in. It was like... 10 steps to the surgical center. <laughs> and, this is the and the anesthesiologist says, no, your blood pressure is too high. I'm not going to operate on you. Yes. So Frank. And now I got to do it again. So Frank is having it in April. He's going to stay here in Arizona and I'm going to go to my house. Yes. We are protecting our relationship from burnout. I did say to Frank, hey, when I'm in Hawaii, if you have problems, you need to put the emergency number is not me. It's your stepdaughter. Exactly. 
But but the healthcare system will try to sabotage you. Oh yes. Okay. Well, How so? They want females to take care of you. Well, well tell them what, what the doctor said when the when we talked about the fact that I was going to be cared for in a rehab center uh, after my surgery. Yeah, the doctor's assistant there said, "Well, you know, you should take care of. You know, are you sure you're not going to take care of him?" <laughs> Research shows if he goes into a rehab unit or he, he won't people, do as well. He won't do as well. <laughs> People don't know this. If you have knee surgery in California, I don't know, um, you know, it depends on your insurance. But if you have it in a hospital, you can go into a rehab unit. Yes. If you have it in an outpatient clinic, your insurance will not pay for pay it. Pay for the rehab. So if you ask your doctor yeah. specifically, does it matter where you operate insurance wise from rehab? You may find out it makes a big difference. Such important news because yes, that that can be very um, expensive. It can, oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. or yeah. as you say, contribute to the care to the caregiver burnout and financial worries. You know, it could be a burden financially, and and you don't want to be a burden to your new relationship. You know, you you don't want that to happen because it really does put a strain, an unnecessary strain yeah. on the relationship. Ask your kids your, or family members to come in and help you. I imagine the same philosophy, in, in your case anyway, would apply as you start looking at um, end-of-life issues, your health proxies and that kind of thing. We have a wonderful thing. Uh, I, this is kind of cute for us, is that Phil was an absolutely wonderful person. My deceased husband. And and the more I find out about him through the family, the more I respect them. And Gloria has a plot next to him. And then there's a plot next to her. Gloria said, well, what do you want to do? And I said, well, I think it would be kind of interesting if I was on the other side of you. And <laughs> and I rose between two thorns. I mean, here. <laughs> So his stepdaughters will have to make that happen. They thought it was kind of cool. I mean, they thought, really? Is that? Is it? <laughs> but it, it's all about talking about it. Yeah, you know, discussing you know, it and find out what works for you because there's so many different options at this point in your life. And don't be hemmed in to old traditional ways. If you have a new thing and you want to be buried next to your loved one and they're going to have their husband next to them, you know, and that works for you. Hey, go for it. I mean, I think it's going to work for me. My son-in-law said, I'm going to put arrows on your tombstone pointing <laughs> each direction. <laughs> I would say you two have this covered. The thing about the book, it talks about all these crazy things. All these, so. all these issues that are, are things that People don't necessarily think of at the time, and they're infatuated with the person. But these are all things you're going to have to deal with. And I yeah. think you're very right to ask us about, okay, what are end-of-life issues? Because you do need to deal with those. I love this idea that you have presented in the, um, in the context of health care and caregiving, is that you are removing the burden from the other person. Gloria, you're removing the burden of care from Frank, and Frank, you very uh, proactively have removed the burden of care uh, from Gloria. And it just seems like that is at root really a communications issue that, that has been a hallmark of your relationship. Absolutely. Because, you know, when you get married, when you're young, you know, for Richard before for death to us part and all that, um, it's a different ballgame. Yeah. And you need to deal with the realities of your current life, not when you were 20 or 30. It is so refreshing to hear you speak of an exciting, really love opportunity that comes um, when it's least expected and in the in the senior years of our lives. Would you have ever guessed that this was going to be in your future? Absolutely not. My husband, deceased husband, said to me, we knew he was uh, in critical condition. He said, Gloria, you're going to have another relationship. And I'm like, oh, no, I'm not. And he said, yeah, you are. And it gave me some sweet permission. He gave permission. But I didn't think that um, it would happen. I said to my granddaughter, she said, uh, Grandma, don't you want to play the field? And I said, Liza, at this age, there is no field. <laughs> <laughs> And for my part, I, I was divorced a couple of years before I met Gloria, 
And I was at the end of my career kind of deciding, well, what am I going to do? You know, I'm, I'm kind of an old guy. Is there really a possibility? And I had gone online and met some lovely people uh, previously, and I had met my past wife there. And so I said, well, one more time. I'm going to go on Sober Singles one more time. Because I was all set to go to the senior community and see what my chances are. <laughs> And look what uh, the heavens sent. Uh, it, ah! it, uh, yeah, it is. Um, what a wonderful Valentine's story. I think this is going to make everybody, um, it's going to put a spring in everyone's step to consider that. <laughs> I hope uh, so. This, bring in our step, that's for sure. <laughs> so are you guys the one-offs? Are you the um, unicorns of the senior dating set? What? How? How do you address that? When people say, oh, sure, well, it happened to you. You guys were lucky. Uh, not going to happen to me. We're having a blast helping other people yeah. get over their fears, get over their feeling of, oh, no, I'm too old. There's no one out there. All the good guys are, all the good women are taken. All those kind of things that we say to ourselves, that's not true. No, not you only true. need one person. One person. One person. That's all you're looking for. Yes, it happened. It happened to us. And but we talk and we see it happening all the time. We see the now day because day. people know what they're doing. Yeah. Also, we hear people say, come up. We met online. You would be surprised. I'm surprised how many people have met online. Yeah. It, it's really high. Yeah. And I'm talking about older people, 50, 60, yeah. 70. The largest yeah. increase in a group is the seniors that are online. There are more seniors getting online percentage wise than any other age group. You know, online dating specifically. Online dating. You know, it's where the action is. If you want to catch fish, go to where the fish are. <laughs> and I'm a fish. I got hooked. <laughs> <laughs> Happily so. Happily so. <laughs> are there tricks or tips outside the the scope of your book that you would suggest people try or keep in mind as they either contemplate on online dating, get them over the hump to say, okay, I'm going to do this. Well, we have kind of a set of five rules about dating. One that we've already talked about, and that is making sure that you get a dating buddy and you don't do this alone. You should never go in your head alone. You need to have people help you figure out what, what's working and what's not to deal with the sadness about something that's a disappointing state or the joy of meeting someone that you're really excited about. And then it takes time to date. You need to know that. And you need to create some space in your life for it. And you may even want to clean out a closet or a drawer that you might think. Make will space remind for you. someone new. If you want someone, you've got to make space. And then we talk about going where the action is. 80% of women will be widowed in their lifetime. Remember, but it's 50, 50 online because more men go online than women huh. do. So that changes the odds. It really grows through your disappointments because not everyone is going to be the ideal date or the perfect person for you. So that you're going to have to go through a number of different people, probably to find the one. But uh, every time you have a relationship, and we call them almost relationships, where wow, we're really excited about this. We have a couple of dates. We're maybe dating for a month or two. And all of a sudden you find that there is some kind of issue that you can't get past. And, and so you've learned you're a better dater. You're a better consumer. And so take that in. Be yourself as, hey, now I'm a veteran. I know exactly what I want and what I don't want. Now you were saying about going on a date. I want to back up a little bit. You're going for 15 minutes of coffee. Yeah, <laughs> uh, maybe longer. <laughs> I lasted two no, hours. No, if, if you don't like them, we talk about how you can kind of turn somebody down sweetly. But you meet them for coffee and you say, you know, you're nice, but I don't think it's going to work out. And you right. leave. And we wish you luck. We, we wish some. you luck finding somebody and you leave. Yeah. And and you keep doing that until you get. But as I as you said, you might meet people some somewhere else once you get out of the sweats, once you get a smile on your face, you buy a new scarf, you put on a little more makeup, you know, whatever. Who knows? But what have you got to lose? You never know where Cupid's arrow is going to fall. Exactly. <laughs> Open to Love, The Secrets of Senior Dating hits the bookshelves today at Amazon and other outlets. So does listening to Gloria and Frank make you eager to try dating? Or do you have a chapter of your own to share? 
If so, please tell us about it on our Crow's Feet feedback line at 943-300-5227. Leave your story or thoughts and your first name only. That's 943-300-5227. Just let it ring and wait for the beat. The call is free. Oh, and your comments may be heard on a future Crow's Feet episode, so keep it real, okay? Thanks. Happy Valentine's Day from all the crew at the Crow's Feet podcast. Executive producer Nancy Peckenham, along with George Ace Acevedo and Elizabeth Allen, Lee Bench, Melinda Blau, Jean Feldison, Jan M. Flynn, Nancy Franklin, and me, Jane Trombley. Editing and sound design by Rich Halton, and our theme music was composed and performed by Rand Bishop. Thanks for joining us on this episode of Crow's Feet, Life as We Age. Don't miss any of our great stories. Subscribe to Crow's Feet wherever you get your podcasts. And be sure to tell your friends and family to give a listen to and leave a rating or review. You can read more Crow's Feet stories online at medium.com forward slash crows hyphen feet. So until next time, remember to savor every moment. As Jackie Joyner Kersey said, age is no barrier. It's a limitation you put on your mind. How about making friends with your Crow's Feet?